Okay, so th for those of you who don't know, um, <clears throat> and Mike has been here for the entire history of it, but we were established in 2001 with Randall Carbon Fiber. We grew out of another company called The Basement Guys, it was Luke Seacrest and his brother, Doug. Um, Mike, who's the other guy on the call you just heard me talking to, <clears throat> Mike worked with The Basement Guys and ran it from uh, the very, very beginning. They were, they started out right around $100,000 in sales and they were up over $4 million in sales with over 40, with 50 employees. But I think, Mike, that's not actually your highest year, is it? You guys got over, I think he told me you guys were almost over $8 million in a year on your yeah, largest. Our best, yeah, our best year ever was, I think, and we maintained it for, I don't know, three or four years, uh, was well into the 10 to $15 million range. So we grew significantly. Um, you know, we were in four different states uh, based in central Ohio, basically touched every surrounding state. Uh, so there's a lot of moving bits and pieces to that. Uh, and the reason that this is an important thing that we kind of talk about this is just so you guys have a better understanding of who we are and where we've come from. Uh, a lot of the products that we have are, are geared towards solving a lot of the solutions that you would see in a residential situation. Uh, and how those, I mean, today's presentation is kind of to show how those can be used universally across residential and commercial markets. Um, but you know, this isn't something that we're guessing at. This is something that we did day in and day out uh, and developed a lot of what you see today uh, out of necessity because there was nothing in the market that could suit what we needed uh, for our market. Yeah, and I, I think it, we're, we're very contractor centric. We talk about it all the time that we're contractor forward. Um, as a result of that kind of feeling, it's easier for us when we bring contractors on because the things are designed around them. Um, next slide is going to be the history of carbon fiber, right? Uh, yeah, this oh. is more about us. Um, yep. So, well, the best part about this that I the, the part that I take out of this is <clears throat> we have patents in the U.S. and Canada. We've been doing this since 2001. Um, the crack lock is a worldwide patent. There are trademarks and awards every single year. 2017 Innovation of the Year, World of Concrete with a crack lock, uh, and we're owned by, uh, our parent company is EGT Products out of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. Um, it's Drycore, Barricade, Insul Armor, and Rhino as the four that are in that group. <clears throat> so you may see us and not know that you're seeing us, which is kind of nice. Uh, this is usually a quiz, pop quiz thing that we talk about before. You know, in 1879, Thomas Edison invented carbon fiber. It's been around longer than modern rebar. Uh, carbon fiber was a hell of a, it's really, really strong, horrible way to make a light bulb in, in Edison's own words. Uh, in the mid 1980s, carbon fiber kind of in, got into the swing of things. By the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, you're seeing a lot of the UCSD and U of A stuff that came out where um, a couple of a few engineers from University of California, San Diego, and a few engineers from the University of Arizona, Tucson, where I live, uh, and where my daughter and my wife go to school. Uh, the University of Arizona is credited with the patent for the modern application of carbon fiber that we know and see today. So it's been going around for a while, but it really has come into its own in the last 20 years. Uh, the primary advantage of carbon fiber um, in structural strengthening, the thing that we, we talk about a lot, it's non-corrosive, it's lightweight, it's high strength, and it's durable. Now, non-corrosive is important. How many times you see rebar come to your job site already has rust on it? Um, you don't have to worry about it ever rusting, corroding. It won't go bad because it's exposed to salt water. It won't go bad because it's exposed to acids, um, other things like that. So it's in some environments, it's fantastically well-suited to any number of odd things that can touch it. So, um, I mean, the most recent one that I think is really cool is that we did a, we did one in Yuma for Johnson Controls and the battery plant there, their concrete is so bad that it's like walking on sponges. Um, it, it's just horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. And we used a carbon fiber and another chemical in a slurry mix. And now they have perfect concrete all the time, all year round. It's not destroying itself with the battery acids and stuff like that. So um, it'll hold up to a whole lot of stuff. 
So typically when we're looking at carbon fiber for commercial repair, this is one of the things that we see the most, which is column confinement. Uh, that you'll hear an engineer talk about columnar confinement. You'll hear about uh, column strengthening, column repair, things like that. But this is typically what you're seeing. And as you can see, this bridge was wrapped in carbon fiber and you can't even tell. You got a really nice close up of the bridge columns that had already been wrapped and they're over there on the right hand side. As you can see, Mike's highlighting them right now. The cool thing about it is it really does just disappear into the background. You can't see it. So it's a great repair. That's yeah, a couple years, a couple years ago in Central Ohio, we had a uh, tanker truck that ran into uh, the column for a bridge, and it basically exploded and, and got hot enough to where it started to melt the rebar within the concrete. Uh, and rather than closing down Interstate 70 for over a year uh, down to one lane, uh, they were able to utilize carbon fiber, fixed it in two months, and saved like 90% of the actual cost of removing and replacing that bridge deck. So. Uh, you know, those are some of the high points as far as what this type of repair can, can accomplish. Uh, obviously, the benefits are uh, decreased downtime uh, and loss of use of those roadways. Uh, but in addition to that, it's exponentially more affordable to reinforce in place rather than uh, reinforce in place rather than have to remove and replace it. Yeah, and one of the things that we come up with on a regular basis that we get tasked with is <clears throat> repairing things that haven't come up yet, like the bridge that you see here on your right um, in this group section, the picture on your right, those bridges aren't even built yet. And when they did some additional seismic restraints, and they did some additional seismic concerns, they realized they were just a little bit under. And so we ended up covering those in carbon fiber on a wrap all the way around the base of those pillars to give them the additional strength that you're talking about. They didn't have to tear it back down and restart. Um, one of the things that we come off with on a regular basis is that we're very, very green. Um, very, there is no water consumption except for the employees that are that are on site. Um, that's necessary for our product to work. So there's no water consumption. We use a no VOC uh, epoxy base, so it's all very green and and moving forward with that kind of stuff. It's something that you're going to see a lot where your leads and all the other. Weird, I got muted. Did you mute me? I'm impressed. Yeah, sorry about that. No, you're fine. Totally cool. Um, so the next slide. Yep. Uh, where are we at here? Oh, so most common, most common repair that we see in a commercial industry is the slab repairs and the beam repairs, like you're seeing here. Um, these are split T's. Um, in this in this and you see where the t's come in and they sit on top of the beams those primary and secondary beams are wrapped for flex and for shear they gain an enormous amount of strength and there are a bunch of different design potentials in this most of them what you'll see though is this kind of horseshoe shaped stirrup shaped wrap that goes around partially around up to the top again the one on the right is like that <clears throat> this larger picture in here um the what you'll see is a change of use like this uh, this Church of Scientology where they had to have, they ended up putting offices into a space where they had um, parking structures. And so they had to reinforce the floors in a whole different way. Have some new penetrations, some, some walls had to come out, some walls had to go in. And it, it really gives us the best construction methods um, being super cost effective, not tearing it down. Um, also, they don't have to add a whole bunch more concrete, a bunch of weight and everything else. You're talking about a much easier thing. In this particular case, it was a unidirectional carbon fiber that was designed with our engineering team in, ha in hand. So it's a fantastic solution. Oof. So for those of you who think that you want to jump into commercial head first, I just want to warn you in advance. There are some things that you're going to be looking into, and this is one of the things that comes up. Look, Mike, our pretty little saturation machine all fixed up and ready to go. Um, right. So uh, it's sitting in my garage, as a matter of fact. Um, one of the, they have a great potential for you for profit, but remember, much slower pay cycles. That means a lot of times you guys are getting paid as they're paid. So those kinds of things are something to take into consideration that you're not talking about the average residential job where you're being paid a portion in advance and then upon the completion and boom, you're done. In this particular case, you're talking about you could have six months to a year of pay, pay cycle outs. 
Um, you have higher insurance rates that are typically associated with commercial work for your insurance carriers. Sometimes that's a concern, sometimes it's not. It just depends on how your individual licenses are set. Much higher liability tends to come with a game when you're dealing with the job that we have going on right now that we're bidding in uh, in one of the plants in Alabama that we're working on. It's $670,000 of the material. Um, the labor costs are probably going to be a million uh probably 1.25 million dollars in labor so higher liability comes with that because the higher potential for profit so as the as it goes up just keep that into consideration one of the things you're also going to be looking at is some of the gearing concerns uh in this particular plant they had to be osha and msha certified osha 10 hour their supervisors have to be osha 30 hour and, and they had to have a lot of ppe that normally you wouldn't be walking around with in an average residential entry like um, you know ASTM spec glasses and hard hats, steel-toed boots, metatarsals, uh, mining rig, mining gear stuff, harnesses and fall harnesses and things like that. Just remember that you're taking that into consideration because it's one of the things that people really want to go get commercial jobs and then they don't realize that they have to have a bunch of other things to go with it so um just keep that in mind um here's the reason everybody wants to play with the commercial carbon fiber industry um it's about 3.2 annual 3.2 billion dollars in annual sales if you take the entire residential market and wrap it up into one lump sum it's between 25 and 30 million dollars a year that's 25 to $30 million a year in carbon fiber sold residentially across the world. It is less than 1% of the total $3.2 billion. And the next year, it's supposed to be almost $4 billion um, that we're looking at in as far as that goes. So it's very, very insignificant amount in the residential market. Most of it is done in commercial. Um, there was a, a bill that was passed in 2018 called the Imagine Act. Innovative materials for America's growth and infrastructure and newly expanded. So um, that's Imagine. And it basically makes engineers look at carbon fiber composites and things like that as their first solution rather than their third or fourth or whatever. Um, and then the other reason that we're going to be making a huge difference here is AACE has said that there are 88 million trips taken every single day on structurally deficient roadways and bridges. Um, we actually rank as a D minus for the ASCE, that's the American Society for Civil Engineers, a D minus. And that's because the infrastructure that we built was built in the 50s and it had a 70 year lifespan. Uh, that when it was built, it had a 70 year lifespan. But what they were finding out now is that they're structurally deficient after only 25 to 30 years. And so those bridges aren't doing what they expected. And so they're coming up with these nice little neat pocket niche industries that we fit in perfectly, beam, column reinforcement, bridge deck reinforcement, and stuff like that. We do a lot of work commercially on bridges. It's just the way it goes. So some of the jobs you'll be looking at, that's a water tank in Las Vegas. Uh, another column strength example, slab strengthening. Now, yes, these are, are very, very crazy examples um, of those patterns being put on. It's very rare for you to see, like in the slab strengthening one, where you see 100% of the slab is covered by carbon fiber. That's really, really rare. Um, wall strengthening, that's actually a blast wall for a, a fly ash bin in a power plant to keep the operators from dying in the event of an explosion. Um, so that's overkill on an Uber level. Uh, really cool, we talked about it being sustainable and green. Um, it is substantially less expensive to restore a structure than to replace it. So that's where we're coming in to help them out. In this particular case, Mike knows a lot about this case because I think you were actually out there, but this is actually a wind loaded wall. that They found that when the wall was hit by some of the really high force winds they have in the area, it was actually causing the wall to flex and they were afraid they'd have the wall fall in. So they went in there and did a repair or a re not really repair, more of a, a reinforcement where they put that, then the straps are on both sides of the wall and they go all the way up and down. So it was a really cool job. Yeah, in, in addition to the wind load, since this was in Cincinnati, it had to be designed for uh, snow load because it was a flat roof. Uh, and you can barely see it here, but if you kind of take a peek 
in between the truck and the lift, you can see that rail. Uh, this is actually a loading zone ramp as well. So they were, they were uh, engineering and designing for impact uh, potential with a semi truck trailer as well. Yeah, because they, they actually made that reinforcement go on both sides. Um, there's actually yeah. reinforcement on the inside of the wall and on the outside of the wall, um, which yeah, for us. Are... Go ahead, John. No, I was going to say that's a really a rarity for us to have them tell us we have to have positive and negative reinforcement. So it makes sense when they had it engineered for not smacking into a wall. Yeah, and those were actually, there was three layers of fiber in each one of those locations. Um, so if you look closely here, you can see like, so this was the longest length and then it staggered down and got shorter and shorter for each layer here. Um, and, and then these were on four foot centers on this side and then opposing four foot centers on the inside. So you basically ended up with a strap about every two feet. Uh, location between the inside and the outside. Yeah, it's pretty crazy how reinforced that wall is. And mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, I have this in my backyard, but um, I will leave this with Mike. Um, this is the residential section of it. Uh, and re Mike is the undisputed champion of all things residential. So I will, I will bow out for him. Yep. All right, Johnny, thank you. Uh, so this is going to be an extremely common uh, type of repair that you would see uh, in a residential scenario. Uh, this is your typical falling concrete. Uh, you'll see it in commercial applications as well. It's pretty much if it's poured concrete and it has rebar in it exposed to water, uh, that, that rebar starts to rust. As it rusts, it expands and it breaks that concrete apart. Uh, and this is basically the result of that process. Uh, so this is kind of the process to uh, make the necessary repairs uh, and prevent that from happening again in the future. Uh, so it's basically just your, your loose concrete's removed. Uh, you're going to do a rust inhibiting coating on the three bar itself. Uh, and then from there, you're going to repack sound repair mortar in there. And then you can do your carbon fiber overlay on the surface. Uh, so with this, you're getting multiple types of benefits from it. Uh, you're reinforcing that area. So you're holding the patch together. Uh, you're taking care of any surface falling. Uh, that may be there within the concrete itself that wasn't able to be removed. Uh, so you're doing a confinement essentially. Uh, but in addition to that, you're getting uh, a semi-waterproof coating on there as well. So if there's any water, uh, you know, groundwater in this case that may hit that area, rather than it sitting there and soaking into that concrete uh, and then, you know, expanding and contracting with the freeze and thaw cycles, which just further damages the concrete, uh, the carbon fiber basically protects that entire area from being subjected to that type of damage again. Uh, so just keep in mind you're getting kind of two types of benefits from these types of repairs as far as you know keeping the elements away from the concrete itself and then you're obviously confining it and reinforcing it. Uh, this is a different type of repair and honestly one that came to us that we had never really even considered. Um, this is the byproduct of uh, fracking. So for those of you that are uh, in parts of the world that uh, fracking is very prevalent, like it is here in Ohio. Uh, this is actually southeastern Ohio. Uh, so these fracking companies, when they go in and they do their, their drilling, uh, they basically become responsible for every structure that is on that property, whether it's, uh, you know, a hundred-year-old barn like you see on the left or somebody's home like you see in the other two pictures. Uh, they basically have to uh, move those people off of that property, uh, put them up in a hotel short term until they're done, uh, but with that, they're responsible for any damages done to the structures themselves. Uh, so this company contacted us uh, where they were previously having to pick the home up, build a new foundation, uh, and then put the home back down because the damage was so was so bad, uh, like you kind of see in that center picture. Uh, that's the type of damage that they were looking at. Broken footers, uh, failing foundation walls, you know, a couple inch cracks were opening up. Uh, everywhere within these homes. Uh, so what they started to do, they reached out to us uh, and, and saw what type of opportunities they had uh, by utilizing our material. So they were going in and as a preventative measure, uh, installing our carbon fiber to reinforce the wall. Uh, yes, you will still see damage that's prevalent even with the carbon fiber on there. Uh, but what they found was the damage was minimized to a point to where they didn't have to relocate these people for the duration of the project. Uh, and they weren't forced to completely rebuild these people's homes or barns or whatever structures that were there. Uh, so it was a benefit for everybody. Nobody was displaced. 
uh, and the structures weren't completely ruined where they had to be rebuilt. Uh, so obviously, again, financial benefit, but also uh, increase in safety. Uh, and, and it was just a much faster process for them to get the project complete. So you'll hear Johnny and I and anybody that you talk to uh, in the composite world, you're gonna have uh, different types of needs of carbon fiber. Um, your most common are gonna be your unidirectional and your bidirectional, and that just refers to the orientation of the fibers themselves. Uh, so the first one we'll talk about here is your unidirectional. Uh, so that's going to be all vertical, all horizontal. Um, either one, we carry both. Um, but for your, you know, a lot of your structural strengthening as far as your beams and slabs and columns, you're going to need uh, a unidirectional for that material. Uh, and you can kind of see here your strength is in this orientation here, uh, where it's the directions of the carbon fiber itself. Just a couple examples, uh, again, of some of the confinement that Johnny talked about in the commercial industry. Uh, again, you could use this for general crack repair, which we'll get into here in a little bit. The other type of material that we carry is a bi-directional. That offers you strength in both directions. Uh, so you can kind of see here the carbon fiber is woven a 90 degree orientation, uh, both vertically and horizontally. Uh, so it's used a lot for both wall applications, uh, stair step cracking and corners. And the benefit is, is you just have reinforcements going in both directions rather than one. Uh, so if there's any type of movement that occurs, uh, you basically have that strength in that plane. So next we're gonna kind of jump into some of the actual uh, processes of uh, the installation for some of our uh, residential repairs. Uh, so this will basically be kind of a, a run through the gamut of uh, different types of damages that you would see the products that we have and the kits that we have uh, to take care of those and then how to install them. The first one we'll talk about is the most prevalent and most common use for our material, and that is the Bode wall solution. Um, that is our patented product. We were the first to the market with a top and bottom connection. Uh, we feel that we have the most complete system for reinforcing a basement foundation wall or a freestanding uh, commercial wall. Uh, it's gonna link you into the framing of the structure at the very top. Uh, so you're gonna go into the sill plate and a foundation wall, uh, and then you're gonna tie into the footing or the slab itself uh, to prevent shear from occurring on the bottom of that wall. Uh, all of our carbon fiber, with the exception of our crack lock stitch, is gonna be a wet lay application, meaning the carbon fiber is in its woven raw state, uh, and then it is mated with the epoxy for the wet lay application. This is what uh, our typical bowed wall repair kit looks like. We do offer this in a unidirectional as well. Uh, it just really kind of depends on what the project is calling for as far as strengths go. But each, each kit comes with everything to do three repair, which in most cases will be uh, about 12 feet of reinforcement uh, on that wall. This is uh, the kind of the telltale sign that you have some deflection occurring on the wall itself. Uh, you tend to see uh, horizontal joint open up uh, pretty much continuously through the length of that wall. And it's going to be just below the three stall line, uh, about a course or two below your soil level. Uh, and this is kind of just a really, really generic diagram of um, the spacing guidelines for materials. Um, you know, your typical wall four foot centers is going to be your maximum. Uh, obviously, we do adjust that based upon higher loads, uh, taller walls, things of that nature. Uh, but generally speaking, four foot centers would be where you would place the straps. Uh, and this kind of illustrates some of the adjustments that you would make uh, as far as changing the guidelines for the spacing in the event that you have a pipe protrusion or a window, electrical panel, things of that nature. And this is just basically showing that you would reduce that strap spacing to avoid this window so you have continuous connections top to bottom. Uh, so this wall prep basically uh, is kind of standard for all of our carbon fiber applications. Um, you know, Johnny kind of mentioned on it, in the commercial field, you'll tend to have a lot more sandblasting, things like that to get the walls prepped. Uh, but for your, your residential market, it's gonna be a lot of uh, surface grinding with diamond cup wheels, hook to half a shot back to keep everybody safe. Uh, but what you wanna do is you wanna grind uh, any paint, caulking, anything off of the surface of the wall. And you wanna grind until you get to the aggregate within the block itself. So you can kind of see here, uh, this is bare concrete. You can see the aggregate kind of popping through here. 
uh, you're essentially removing the slurry layer from the face of the block. Uh, for this one, you're going to use, if you're doing a bowed wall application, uh, the material is going to be about six inches wide, uh, so you can use your opposing vertical mortar joints as a grinding guideline, uh, and that'll kind of help you keep it straight so you don't do any unnecessary grinding. Um, you know, we typically recommend anything that's ground to be covered with epoxy, uh, so you don't uh, create the potential for leaping uh, through that exposed concrete. Uh, any of the failed mortar joints, and this is extremely important um, for bowed wall applications, any of the failed mortar joints, you want to remove and replace them if they're loose, uh, and you want to get sound concrete in there. It could be a hydraulic cement, a fast setting cement, type S mortar, uh, whatever you're comfortable with using, but that joint needs to be solid and it needs to be completely filled. Uh, and then you can see up here, there wasn't any cracks that have developed, uh, but this joint was pretty well pointed, so it's pretty deep. So rather than grinding this concrete block until it's completely flush, you can fill it in with hydraulic cement uh, to basically bring that in to where it's flush with the face of the block. Uh, for this application, after the mortar is dried, you can again scuff it lightly with your grinder uh, just to get it kind of roughed up. Uh, you'll go ahead and drill a three quarter inch hole at the cove joint, and that's right where the wall on the floor meets. Uh, you're gonna keep that as near vertical as possible. Uh, obviously, to turn our three-quarter inch mason's bit, you've got a pretty good size drill, uh, so you're not going to be able to get completely vertical, but you want to stay as vertical as possible. And then, obviously, everything should be clean of dust and debris, so hit it with your shop vac, uh, a broom, whatever it is. Uh, shop vac is obviously preferable because it contains the dust for you. So after your prep work is done, uh, you're going to go straight to the strap application. And the very first thing you do uh, is break down one of the cardboard boxes that the kit came in. Uh, go ahead and lay your carbon fiber on there, and you're going to wet out the top six inches of that carbon fiber with the epoxy. Uh, from there, you're going to wrap it around the sill plate bracket two complete times. Uh, and then you go ahead and lag bolt that into the sill plate. The only thing to really look for here, guys, is to make sure that your carbon fiber is centered within these lag bolt locations. Uh, if it's not, the lag bolt will grab a hold of it and it's going to make a mess for you really quick. It basically grabs a hold of the carbon fiber, twists it up, and bunches it really bad. Uh, the other thing is to make sure that your bracket is uh, installed correctly. Uh, if this were to be flipped around, you would basically have the thickness of the bracket that would be holding the fiber away from the sill plate bracket when you ran it down. Uh, so it's very important that the, fa that the fabric comes up the front of the strap and then back down behind it. Uh, so it's in direct contact right here at this location on the wall rather than being held away from the thickness of the bracket. After you have your sill plate all connected and screwed in, uh, you'll go ahead and roll that material up, get it out of your way, uh, and you're going to start with your epoxy application. Uh, starting from the top, you'll work until about halfway down. Uh, you just kind of go in back and forth zigzag motions. Uh, your base coat of epoxy is going to be your heavy coat. Uh, that's going to do the saturating into the concrete, and it's also going to be your bond layer for uh, the carbon fiber when you lay it into it. Uh, so you want to work about halfway down. Uh, that'll help with the epoxy wanting to run. Uh, so you'll go ahead and trowel it out after that point. And then once you have the epoxy situated where you want it, go ahead and repeat the process for the bottom half of the wall. Uh, any of the epoxy that you may get on the floor or anything like that, you can go ahead and push that into the hole that you pre-drilled at the base there. Uh, that's a good place to put it. It helps clean it up and plus you need epoxy in that location anyway. So after you have your epoxy bed laid out, uh, everything in that area where the strap's going to go uh, has a nice wet look to it. Uh, you'll go ahead and lay the strap into the epoxy. Uh, so you'll unroll your carbon fiber, give it a little tug, uh, go ahead and lay it down into the epoxy base uh, and you'll start to see the epoxy soak through to the surface of the fiber from the back side of it. Uh, that's a key indicator that you have a good base coat of epoxy uh, and that you should have a successful application as far as the bond goes. Uh, at this point, if you're using one of our bowed wall kits, uh, they come in predetermined lengths. Um, so if you're working like a seven foot six wall or something like that, you're going to have some extra material at the bottom. Uh, you can go ahead and cut that material with a sharp pair of scissors, but you want to leave six to eight inches uh, running out onto the floor so you can make your bottom attachment. And the process for that here, kind of starting from the left to the right, 
you have your additional couple inches here hanging out under the floor, uh, go ahead and coat that in epoxy. You're going to take the left and the right corner, fold that behind the strap itself. That's going to create kind of a V shape. And then from there, you just twist it to the left or the right, and then tuck it into that hole that you pre-filled about halfway with epoxy, uh, and that is your bottom connection point. Um, one little tip and trick here, guys. A lot of times we get people that have a difficult time with this bottom connection because the material is kind of V-shaped all the way up to here. Uh, that's not going to affect the strength of anything as far as that bottom shear pin goes. Uh, but if you just want kind of a more professional, uniform look, uh, go ahead and install, install a couple additional straps. At that point, the epoxy is tacked up a little bit, so you can come back to this and you can kind of manipulate it a little bit uh, to get it squared off with the floor. And the, since the epoxy is tacked up a little bit, it'll actually be able to uh, overcome the memory of that fiber from tucking it into such a small hole. So after you're happy with everything, the straps straight, your top and bottom connections are accomplished, you're going to go back uh, over the surface of the strap and you're going to apply a light second coat of epoxy. Uh, this is going to be much lighter than your base coat. Uh, all you're trying to achieve with this is just an overall wet look to the carbon fiber. Uh, this is going to guarantee that you have 100% saturation. Uh, you don't have And yes, have that's Mike. That's yeah. Mike's head right there. That's Mike doing the install. It is, it is. You don't, you don't, you don't have to have like a super thick layer of epoxy. Uh, some of our customers get confused uh, with the amount of epoxy that we send in the kits themselves. It's very important, like you're not creating a finished car part, you know, you're not, it, this isn't like a car hood that has to be super strong for the thick, thick coat of epoxy. Uh, this is just very simply to make sure that you have the entire surface coated with epoxy. Yeah, and it's typically a 20 to 30 mil application on the top coat. So you're talking about the thickness of a credit card, if not a little bit thinner than that. So right. it's not. Yeah, it, it's not going to be anywhere near as thick as the base coat because you're not trying to you're not trying to soak into the block or anything like that. You're literally just coating the surface of the carbon fiber. Um, a couple of things to kind of speed your installations up, and this is from my time of managing uh, a bunch of different crews that were doing a lot of carbon fiber. Um, when you get to the job site, you have one guy immediately starts to grind the strap locations. Uh, from there, you're going to have the other crew member immediately start hanging the carbon fiber. Uh, that kind of sets them up in an offset situation to where um, they're not doing the same thing together. Uh, so one guy's grinding, he continues to go on. One guy starts installing from the first strip location. Uh, and by the time they get through with the grinding, the, the guy doing the carbon fiber should be right there. A couple of things to check for when you're doing your epoxy installation is uh, when, you, when you try out the epoxy, you work from the bottom up, uh, so it tends to kind of build and roll out to the outside edges. Uh, that epoxy is not going to do you any good out there because it's going to be outside of where the strap is. So kind of check the edges and push any epoxy that you may have outside of that area uh, into the center so that way it actually does some work for you. Uh, another thing is we really, really love these things. Johnny and I have them all in our house ourselves because our tough weight. Uh, they're specifically <laughs> formulated to remove epoxy, uh, and that's from your crew members, your tools, uh, anything like that. Uh, they, they can basically clean up the work environment and keep everybody safe. Uh, so just make sure you guys have those in hand when you do any application. Yeah, they, they do an enormous amount of good. I mean, and the best part about it is it's not toxic. You're not talking about acetone where you're killing yourself or anything like that. It's you can wipe it up and then if you don't have time to wash your hands for a few minutes, you're fine. It's not like the other ones where you're just, you know, your fingers start to tingle from the acetone, your fingernail fall off. Yeah, and we we basically sourced those because we had guys that were telling us that they were using you know, diesel fuel, gasoline, acetone paint thinners to clean up their hands and stuff like that. Obviously, the safety of the customers is important, so we, we took the time to go out and find something that we knew would be safe uh, and efficient for our customers. Uh, a couple other things that we get, and obviously this is a pretty short list, we could go on forever about this, but uh, just to kind of briefly touch on the common things that we have to adapt for with our bow wall installations, uh, would be in older structures that have no sill plate at the top of the foundation wall. Uh, 
if you don't have anything to attach to, having that bracket is not going to do you any good. It's, you know, screwed into the floor above, or you know, if it's in a, a cold cellar or something like that, and it's concrete on the top. Uh, so rather than using a bracket, you just use the strap horizontally at the top, and and that basically ties all the all the straps together. Uh, if you have an interior drainage system uh, that exists before the carbon fiber is installed. Uh, that's kind of a case-by-case -case scenario based upon how the system was installed, uh, but it is still possible to install the carbon fiber with an existing drainage system. Here's a couple examples. Uh, key things to check in on this one, you can see the main tail joint has been repaired, and they're at different heights because this was a, uh, on the hillside, uh, but this installer followed all of our spacing guidelines to the key. Uh, did their joint repair, and you can see they actually utilized the crack repair here as well underneath the window. Uh, we'll touch on that one here next. A couple other installations here. Uh, again, joints were repaired. This wall had actually already sheared. The engineer called for uh, some carbon fiber there to reinforce that joint as well. So the crack repairs we have, uh, and we consider anything that any of our 12 inch wide carbon fibers to be crack repair. Um, so we have it in vertical orientation, horizontal and bi-direction. Uh, it can be used for a multitude of things. So from confinement to uh, just general crack repair, it could be for stair-step cracking, anything like that, you can use it uh, to basically get surface reinforcement in those cracks themselves. Uh, the prep work is going to be just like the big wall. You're going to grind until you see the aggregate. You're going to fill in any low spots with your mortar joint, uh, with your hydraulic cement or uh, like material. Um, and then you're, you're basically going to go ahead and start with the uh, application as far as the uh, epoxy and carbon fiber goes. This was actually a uh, automotive mechanic shop. The corner had started to fail with pretty serious uh, stair step cracking. That's where you see the 12 inch wide carbon fiber utilized right here, or that kind of wraps around the corner. Um, it's some pretty significant stair step cracking there. And then to further tie the corner together, they used our uh, carbon fiber as a, in a corner repair kit orientation. Um, this is the after effect. We had kind of touched on this in the commercial application uh, previously with the columns. Uh, but any exterior application with the carbon fiber, it needs to be painted or, uh, you know, coated in an elastomeric stucco, some, some sort of cementitious product uh, to protect it from the UV rays. Uh, but in addition, you know, rather than having steel girders and, you know, whalers tying this corner together, uh, it's a pretty, pretty streamlined, pretty uh, non-obvious uh, type of repair that's done here. Unless you were really looking for it, you probably wouldn't. So the crack repair is adaptable uh, to be used for water control. Uh, if you're going to use it for water control, you do have to remove a small section of the slab. Uh, and the idea here is you're basically structurally reinforcing that crack, but you're also creating a waterproof barrier. Uh, so any water that enters into that crack is basically diverted below the slab uh, and then released from the footer. So you have to remove a small section of the concrete here. Uh, add some clean gravel in, uh, and then you do your carbon fiber application. Uh, basically, this water hits the back of the material, it's forced down, and then it's released into the gravel, and then over to the sump pump or the drainage system. Some things to look for to determine if it's a good candidate for a crack repair for water control is the crack must be continuous all the way down to the slab. Uh, if this crack stops halfway down the wall, say it's underneath a window or something like that, uh, the crack repair is not going to be good for water control. It would be great to reinforce that area, but not to stop the water. It would basically just hold that water within the wall and cause further damage. Uh, if, you, if it doesn't have a way to release, uh, then you can't use the carbon fiber on its own as a standalone repair. Uh, the corner repair, like we kind of saw there, and the um, a mechanic shop picture there a couple slides back. This is the most beautiful corner repair I've ever seen in my life. Um, <laughs> no lie. But it's, yeah, it, it really is. Um, it, but it's basically the, the, the unique thing about it is it's the same carbon fiber and it's the same epoxy that we use for the bird wall. 
once you get familiar with working with that material, it's pretty universal across a lot of our carbon fiber applications as far as working with the material itself. It's really just the application that changes. So the orientation of the fiber may change, uh, the layout of the fiber may change, but as far as the learning curve of working with the material, it's not that much different. Uh, so the prep work again will remain the same. You're gonna grind the surface, uh, fill in any mortar joints that are low, repair any cracks. Uh, to achieve a point of repair that is this great, it's gonna be a two-man operation, and it's gonna have to be uh, gorilla tape on the edges, and it's gonna have to be plastic off between it. Um, and the reason that this is a two-man job is the only way to keep it clean is to have one guy applying the epoxy, and then uh, the, the next guy standing right beside him prowling that epoxy out and immediately laying the fiber in. Working with it horizontally like this, the epoxy wants to run. Uh, so if you don't have somebody immediately trialing it out, it's gonna wanna run down the face of the wall. That's where the plastic and the tape come in. Uh, Gorilla tape is the best for this application. Uh, the epoxy can't get past it. So it, it, if you care about how it looks, that's what you have to do to get it to look like this. If not, it's not gonna be the end of the world. You just use more epoxy than necessary and you're gonna have some runs down the wall. But the idea with this repair is basically any time that you have the point of the corner facing you, if it starts to stair step or crack and pull away, uh, you can basically use this material to kind of hold that corner together to resist the load that's being placed that's trying to tear this wall apart at the corner. So it's really common that you'll have, you know, a garage on the other side of this wall that the slab is pushing on it. Uh, it could be used on it if you're doing an excavation. Uh, on the foundation of wall, or if it's a freestanding commercial building like we saw with the uh, automotive shop, you know, it, it can be used to basically repair any corner that the face of that or the point of that corner is facing you. Next product is crack injection. Um, this is not something that we invented or, uh, you know, tried to recreate. It's a pretty standard application. Uh, our products are unique though. Uh, we have a resin, which is a extremely low viscosity. Uh, it's very similar to water. So the principle behind that is if water can travel through it, so can our resin. Uh, and then we have a polyurethane expanding foam. Uh, and what's unique about that is it's 100% solid. Uh, a lot of the polyurethanes in the market are 50% water. Uh, so when you inject, the water is what actually causes that to expand. Uh, ours does not have water. It's pure, pure chemical. So basically, itself is clean. Uh, so you're getting more value, more material for your money with that. Um, and it does set solid. It doesn't remain flexible. Uh, it, it cures out pretty hard. It doesn't offer any structural strength, though. Uh, so we typically will train uh, our installers to utilize the crack repair on the surface of any crack injection. Uh, so your resin is going to block moisture, it's going to set fast, uh, it's going to be used for your hairline cracks, um, you know, and the polyurethane is going to be used for wider cracks, cracks where there's water concerns or where there may be any voids on the outside of the wall. The installation process, like I said, is pretty streamlined across pretty much any manufacturer's um, product line. But you're basically just going to, you know, either grind the surface uh, or take a stiff wire brush to it to remove any loose concrete. Uh, you apply our high strength paste to the surface. Go ahead and set your port. Uh, our ports are also unique. They're completely clear, so you can actually see if the material is filling. Uh, and they have a very wide base, so you get a better surface mount uh, to the concrete itself. That helps eliminate, um, you know, any pockets that may develop out there and create, create a failure uh, when you do the injection. Uh, but once this is all cured out, uh, you start from the bottom, you insert your nozzle into the, the port, and you're going to inject that until you see the material come out of the port above. Go ahead and cap that off and keep working your way up the wall like a ladder. Uh, and this works in anything for concrete. Uh, it could be a pool, it could be a wall, it could be a parking garage, a deck, it could be anything. Uh, if you need to put it under pressure and get it filled the full depth of the concrete, the crack injection is the way to go. A couple of things to look for when you do the injection. Uh, here in the Midwest, it's pretty common that you'll see poured concrete walls that are designed to look like brick. Uh, they look almost stamped. Uh, if you're working with one of those, you'll need to grind the port base location. 
uh, so where these little guys are going to get stuck to. Uh, you need to run in those areas flush to where that wavy texture is taken away. Uh, that'll just allow the portholes to be mounted a lot more secure. Uh, check for any hairline cracks that are coming off of the main crack. Uh, those need to be sealed as well. Uh, when you go to do the injection, you'll get material that'll come flying out uh, of one of those little branches that come off of the main crack. Uh, and then, obviously, it must be dry. Uh, both products, both injection products are water tolerant. But if you are trying to do this on like an actively leaking track, it's basically going to wash the surface epoxy away and you won't get a good seal. Uh, and you'll, you'll have a failure as soon as you go to do the injection. So it must be dry. That doesn't mean it has to be bone dry, uh, but there can't be actively leaking. And the final product we're going to talk about here, guys, is the concrete crack lock. Uh, this is the one that Johnny mentioned that we have a worldwide pending patent on. Uh, and this is what a lot of people consider a stitch product. We don't like to call it that, uh, but that's kind of what tend, people tend to kind of call it. Uh, but the principle here is if it's poured concrete and it's got a crack in it, uh, you can use the crack lock to uh, basically hold that crack together, to keep it from being able to move around, uh, to be able to keep that crack from mitigating further. Uh, so essentially it's gonna cease all movement that's occurring in that crack itself. Uh, the installation process is its key benefit. It's extremely fast to install these. Uh, you're not removing a lot of concrete. You're not putting a lot of epoxy back in its place. Uh, you're basically just drilling two holes perpendicular to the crack, and you're uh, making a single pass uh, either with a wet saw or a tuck point grinder, and you just epoxy them in place. Uh, our tolerances are so tight that a lot of our customers create wooden templates uh, one of our distributors is actually working on uh, a metal template to where you can basically just set this down right on top of the crack, go ahead and drill, cut between the two, and you'll know that when that crack lock arrives that it's going to fit right into your prepped area. That's how tight our tolerances are on the crack lock. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, these are all from one of my customers and the Carolinas. Uh, they do a lot of service work for MI and Ryan Home. Uh, they have a lot of slab on grade, and as you can see, uh, they decided to glue down hardwood floors on a lot of these. So as these cracks develop or these joints open up, uh, it obviously kind of transcribes right through the flooring and it cracks the flooring or buckles it. Uh, so rather than chasing it around and trying to fix it multiple times, which is what they'd previously done in the past, uh, they just decided to go ahead and spend the money to uh, you know, have, have the crack locks installed to you know, a permanent repair that they don't have to revisit and redo flooring two, three, four times. Some of these customers, um, they were saying this is the third or fourth attempt that they've had to fix these cracks. Uh, and every time they had to bring in carpenters to redo the flooring, things like that. Uh, and they've been doing this for about five years now with 100% success rate with no callback. And that does it for us guys. We're actually over by a couple of minutes. Uh, but the last thing we always touch on uh, we have a full-time marketing department, so any needs that you guys have, uh, you know, for presentations that you're going to do yourself, or if you want to, you know, put some of our information on your website, we have all of that pre-generated for you. And obviously, we have a bunch of, you know, technical information, case studies, application instructions, all of that's available on our website. Uh, it's there to download, uh, but if you need something specifically, or if you want it kind of privately labeled or branded to your company, we can do that for you as well. Uh, and then, you know, if any of you guys are interested in having more of your team, um, you know, go through a more in-depth look at some of these repairs, uh, Johnny or myself would be happy to hop on uh, a webinar with you and your team to kind of go further into some of this stuff. Uh, so this is just kind of a high-level overview of some of what we do. Johnny, do you have anything else to add? No, I think you pretty much had it up. Remember to use marketing support, though. I mean, those guys... They need to earn their, their keep too. But the other thing is, I mean, we don't want you guys to have to go through and try and figure out how to build all this stuff that's already built for you. Um, I just had a few few people that have been really, had some major benefit just in being able to go to the marketing team and ask them for help. So just stay on top of it. 